Hey, Joe, it's so great to have you on the show today. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me on, Linda. It's always a, a great privilege. Well, it's an honor to have you. I really respect you. And as Chief Operating Officer of Link2, you are amazing, knowledgeable, have an incredible background as an investment banker and other experience. So I want to really delve into what you know about private equity investing and about the venture capital industry, really what's going on out there in a way that gives us a broad brush of what's happening, but then also maybe drilling down on some of the companies within Link2 that people might want to invest in. How does that sound? That yeah. Sound awesome. So we've been through kind of a, not kind of, we've been through a bear market uh, in the stock market, but how did that impact the venture capital and private equity market last year? It's definitely been impacted, albeit on a delayed basis, Linda. So historically, the, the private markets will correlate, uh, but with a lag to the public markets. And, and that lag is typically six months, which is more or less what we what we saw this time around, right? So the, um, the private markets um, started um, dipping down, and there's a number of ways we were able to measure this, but started dipping down call it uh, the the fourth quarter of 2021, 20, uh, right? And then that significantly accelerated um, in the middle of the year. So quarter two, quarter three of last year was when we saw a significant deepening of, 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 of the, the market uh, in, into bear territory. And that trend continues today. So how, how does... Um, how is that reflected? It's reflected in the fact that valuations um, have declined significantly. So you're seeing that in the secondary trading. So shares that already um, have been issued and are being held, but then resold amongst different parties. And we are an active part of that secondary market link to those shares today uh, for the same company are going to be selling at a discount to what they were selling for same time last year, right? So it, no different than that, that kind of situation for a public company in the public market. Um, companies that are raising primary capital, meaning issuing new shares in the private market today, are doing it at lower valuations than they were doing same time last year. Um, and it, again, that's the same thing. If you were in the, uh, in the public market in a public company doing a follow-on offering, you'd probably get a much lower valuation today because your stock price is a lot lower than, than you did a year ago. So when you talk about valuation, you're talking about market valuation. Uh, you talk about investing in unicorns, which are worth a billion dollars. So some of those have dropped below a billion dollar valuation is what you're saying. And so their stock price has been discounted and is now selling below where it used to sell because the company's now worth less than it was prior to the bear market starting. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and you know, like, like in the public markets, right, you have to be very, very um, discerning uh, about those kinds of declines, because in some cases, it's the result of what I call dislocated markets and just liquidity, right? Meaning that, when, when you're in a bull market and you have lots of money chasing the same stock, that has an upward effect on the, on the price of that stock. And that liquidity effect may actually have nothing to do with the fundamentals of the company improving. So think about it in terms of a PE ratio, right? That it, it may, it, that PE ratio could improve either because, you know, the P goes up or the E, right? Goes right, up. earnings, yeah, um, mm -hmm. and, and 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 in in this instance, if you don't have earnings that are driving it, but simply the fact that the price is being moved up by excess liquidity, you may have the impression that a company has gotten more valuable, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's intrinsically more valuable. It just means that the stock price has gotten bid up. So there, that phenomenon is no different in the private markets, right? We'll go through cycles where private company stock gets bid up and it may or may not have anything to do with the company actually improving its fundamentals. 
Um, on the downside, it's the opposite. Just because a company's, or it's the same analogy, right? Meaning if a company's stock price gets bid down, it may be because the company's economic prospects have deteriorated, but it may simply also be that liquidity has gotten sucked out of that particular stock in the market generally. And so the price is down. Today in the private markets, we have a ratio of roughly um, two to one between the uh, sell side and the buy side in terms of in terms of liquidity. That's a significant market dislocation, right? So what, you does that, what does that mean, Joe? That you have a two what that basically means is that on any given day, there's roughly two sellers for every one buyer in terms of dollar volume for, for any given stock in the private market in the secondary. That's a huge dislocation, right? So buyers like us have a significant amount of market power right now. And that actually is good. It's in bear markets that you make money by investing cheap. And we have right now a, a tremendous opportunity because of the prices are down. We have a lot of market power. We can continue to drive price down. We have a lot of negotiating power in, in these transactions. And as, as a result, we and our clients can benefit from significantly lower entry prices as long as you pick the right companies. That, and that goes back to the thing about making sure that the company's price is lower because of the market liquidity rather than because the company actually is worse today than it was a year ago. Right. So for people who aren't that familiar with private equity, what you're saying is that you actually buy stock from employees of companies that are still private and the price that you can buy that stock from them has actually gone down in the last year since this bear market. So now you're able to get it at a better price and pass it along to link to investors who want to invest in that company. Is that right? That's correct. And the perfect situation is where a company actually has improved its economic performance in that you know, period of time we're talking about, even though their price has gotten driven down. Right. So that's a perfect situation if you're a savvy investor to take advantage of. And we're trying to to do exactly that, Linda, you know, buy cheaper stock of companies who actually have improved. Right. <laughs> in I can the think last of one in particular that I like that that's happened to. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Because that's been driven down, not just by market forces, but, but by externalities, right, that have nothing to do with the market, have everything to do with regulation and the law. Yes. And a, and a lawsuit. Yes. Correct. And we're talking yeah. about Ripple, right, which is one of our lar large holdings. And as, as you know, well, and this, you know, maybe can segue into a, a discussion about, you know, how we make our investments in the process of selecting them, Linda. But because our business model is predicated on linked to using its own capital, its own balance sheet, and putting that capital at risk, right, by making investment selection and closing investments and holding stock before we bring our customers into them and ask them to participate, right? We're always at risk. On every single name on the platform, we're at risk. Yeah, that's right. And that's why investment selection is so important. So how do you decide on new companies that you want to bring onto the platform? It's a, um, a multi-step process, right? And it starts at, at a macro level. It's what I, we do what I call sector selection first, right? And what, what that's fundamentally about is because we're making investments in, 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 in technology in that, in that space. Um, and, and the reason for that, by the way, is because if you, if you look at the S&P 500 or any market index in the public market, you will see that in the last 30 years, technology has become the dominant industry in the United States and certainly in the world. That's reflected by the fact that technology companies comprise the single largest segment of value in, in the equities market, right? And we don't think that's a trend that's going to reverse. So that's the reason why we're investing in private tech companies as opposed to private, you know, grocery stores or private whatever, right? right. Um, 
So we start by, by, by sitting back and saying, okay, what are the foundational technology innovations that are occurring? And, and by that, I'm talking about forms of technology innovation that have a couple of characteristics, right? One is that they're going to lead to quantum improvements of very, very large industries that are operating in really large global markets, right? So what's an example of a foundational technology innovation? It would be something like blockchain or distributed ledger technology. It would be something like gener generative AI. It would be something like autonomous vehicles, right? These are all foundational technology innovations that are going to cause many large industries around the world when they adopt them to significantly improve. And they will have impact because these are industries that operate in very large global markets with, you know, billions of, of people as end customers ultimately, right? Examples of those industries might be finance, you know, transportation, media and entertainment, retail, right? So we're looking at innovations that cut across large industries and and they also result in the creation of new business models right so examples of that would be you know ripple right but out in the public market you would look at companies like uber amazon netflix in the private market link too is a good example you also have drone business. delivery yeah yeah. yeah just, you know, drone delivery is a, is a, is another another thing that's happening and will be will hugely change the whole logistics space, right? There's a company called Zipline in the private market that is doing that on a on a commercial basis already today in certain test markets. And all of these foundational innovations also have the advantage and this is the reason why we invest in that they have long economic tails meaning that the creation of value that results from these deep innovations last are decades long, right? And so you have the opportunity to make an investment. So a good example of that would be Apple, right? If you think about Apple, there was once upon a time, uh, Apple stock was available at 20 bucks in the public market, never mind the, 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 the and that's a company that today still thrives, it's loved, but its price is multiples of, of of 20 bucks and multiples of what you had been able to invest in if you were a private investor in Apple, right? That's a long tail economic, you know, um, play. And it's driven by some very foundational technology. In their case, it was basically mobile computing, right? That's that's what drives um, Apple. So we start by by asking ourselves, what are these foundational technology innovations, right? And there and what sectors um, result from those? And then we we look at specific companies within the sector. We say, okay, we like that sector. Let's find the companies that are going to be important, hopefully winners in those sectors. And there we do a screen. That's a mixture of you know uh, fundamentals. And and market pricing. So on the on the fundamentals, it it, it it's kind of a, a a yes no screen. It's binary. So either a company passes the test or it doesn't. And 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 the test has several criteria. We're looking at companies that are in the mid to late stage of of private venture funding. We're looking only at companies that have revenue. We're only looking at companies that are at the stage where their product and service is already commercialized, meaning they have a demonstrable market with, with customers that you can actually point to. Um, they have strong unit economics that will support profitability either currently or with a clear path in the future towards that because of those unit economics. And then like we talked about earlier, they have a strong management team that's got the experience and the expertise to execute on that business plan, right? So either a company meets our fundamental screen and I've shared some of the criteria, but not all. Um, and if it does, then we look at you know, the price. Are we able to acquire the stock of that company at a price within the acceptable price range that we determine, right? What's the acceptable price range? We How do we determine that we look at comparable public market companies to, and align that with the valuation uh, of that private company stock. We look at where we are in the market cycle, 
to determine is the price being affected by liquidity flows and to what extent? And is this a good time or a bad time to buy because of that? Is it overbought or oversold, right? Are we in a position of market power to negotiate the best entry price? And, and then we, 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 we look at all of those inputs, right? We look at the company's last valuation, which is basically their, call it their book value, right? We look at the company's trading value in the market today, their fair value. And then we try to assess what its intrinsic value is based on the fundamentals. And, and that then allows us a range of prices that we think is, is, is acceptable to pay for that stock, right? So this is all done through a fairly systematic scoring system that we've developed internally. And, and we, we, we we're able to then rate companies internally based on their attractiveness as an investment, based on those fundamentals and based on the price dynamic, right? And then once it passes, once it achieves a certain score and it's a pass, then we go out and actually try to source it. And this is the other tough part. Unlike in the public market, if I did the fundamental screen and the price screen, I would simply go on my terminal and buy it. It doesn't work that way in the private market. There's zero assured availability, right? So now how do you buy it? Well, you have to do an outreach to VC firms. You have to do an outreach to founders. You have to do an outreach to employees to see whether you can get the stock and at the price you want. Um, we also have a lot of inbound solicitations. So that gives us a stream of, of deals to look at. We match that against what's on our, our target list, right? Most of the inbounds aren't on our target list. So we have to say sorry to people. We're not interested in that stock. So it's, it's taking all of those different sources and then actually trying to make the investment. So one of your recent additions was an AI company. And that was very interesting because it's such a hot, you know, sector right now. Tell us about your uh, process with that company. Ah, uh, that was a company that we got um, initially through uh, an employee that uh, was looking to liquefy some of their vested options, right? Um, and once we were able to gain that entry, we became a known quantity to the company because that we were sitting on their cap table for a relatively small amount. And the company we're talking about is um, Cerebras. That's spelled C-E-R-E-B-R-A-S, right? Um, we eventually were able to speak. I was able to speak to their founder and CEO, a great guy named Andrew Feldman. And out of that relationship now, we're able to get unprecedented access to their stock. The company has opened its doors and said, we like what you're doing. We trust what you're doing. Um, we will, when we, whenever we have somebody on the founding team or one of our early VCs or one of our employees want liquidity, you know, we'll call you. And, and if you need more stock and we haven't called you, you call us. And I, you know, I will find somebody in the company that can sell you the shares, right? So it's it's a very close relationship. And Andrew, by the way, is a genius guy who whom I've asked to come to a a, a a link to learn session for our team Apollo members, so that you all can come in and actually meet him directly, ask questions of him directly, and learn more about what they're doing in in the in the whole area of generative AI. Yeah, Team Apollo members are your link to clients who have invested, what is it 60,000? It's uh it's uh now up uh going up to 80,000 because the our our platform gets bigger and bigger and the Team Apollo members are basically the top 20% of our client base so as the as the assets on the platform grow as the cumulative investment grows and that by the way today is about 210 million give or take 210 million from regular people like you and me, Linda, not, not big institutions, right? So that, that, that hurdle to become a team Apollo member keeps on going up. <laughs> yeah. I'm proud to be a part of that group. <laughs> it's, uh, really nice to have a little bit of extra networking. 
Uh, and it's really fun how you, you know, recognize people in that group. So thank you for that. And also, PolySign is a newer company that you've added and have been really excited about, which has been a good compliment for a lot of people that own Ripple stock, which in many cases, I know a lot of my clients came in with the Ripple investment as their first investment, and PolySign has been a good way to diversify. How's it going with PolySign? It's, uh, you know, for the last several months, probably the second most popular stock on, on our platform. And, and in some respects, I think it's it's because it has a lot of the same characteristics as Ripple does. So I would imagine if you're somebody that is interested in a believer in what Ripple is trying to do, you would understand what PolySign is looking to do. Both companies are operating in the digital asset space and creating infrastructure for different use cases within that space, right? So blockchain technology has uses across many industries, but one of the most important industries that it impacts is finance, right? A significant amount of finance is, um, you know, the processing of cross-border payments, payments that are taking place in differing currencies across national borders. That is a huge part of the international banking system. The way it's currently being done is based on technology that dates all the way back to the 70s. So it's horrendously outdated. It's super clunky. It's slow and it's very expensive. Ripple revolutionizes that by applying blockchain technology and allowing those payments to occur very, very cheaply, instantaneously, right? Um, and, and so... That is a, a very important infrastructural play that is going to transform the nature of international payments. PolySign, interestingly, you know, is 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 founded by one of the guys that also founded um, Ripple, uh, one of the most brilliant cryptographers in the blockchain world, a guy named Arthur Brito. And what they're trying to do is create infrastructure that will make more efficient and secure the trading of digital assets so that you can create the kind of broad capital markets that today exist for non-digital assets like equities and bonds and, and commodities, right? There, in those markets, there are certain um, structures that you need to support very, very large institutional trading, large-scale trading. Um, by institutions. So, you know, those take place at very high volumes um, and at very, very, and, and very rapidly. The, the transactions have to be executed very, very quickly. So you've got to support that kind of trading, but with, with some very, very basic structures that also ensure, right, that the counterparties and their end customers are protected. That's, you know, assets don't get stolen or used in some illegitimate fashion that isn't allowed by a fund manager. So you need custody. You need independent fund administration. You need wholesale clearing and settlement. So PolySign is building all those constituent structures, but for the digital asset world. And that's hugely important, number one, because you know, native crypto assets today already total about a trillion in value, and they got as high as three trillion when the market was in a bull phase. That's still, frankly, small compared to what its potential is. Because if you look at the equities world, for example, just U.S. equities alone is 45 trillion. Right? Never mind equities in other parts of the world. Imagine a world where all of those equities and all of those fixed income instruments and all of the derivative instruments that play off of those and all the commodities in the world, if all of those things also became digital, they were tokenized. And then you add that to crypto native assets that are originated on blockchains, like the kinds of layer one and layer two tokens that are in existence already today and growing. That whole mass of value becomes one big digital asset market. You will need, in order to support that market, the kind of infrastructure that PolySign is building. Absolutely. And it is really exciting, the team that they have and 
their technology and all the companies interested in working with them. It's looking very successful. Looks like their future is oh, yeah. very bright. Yeah. Um, how about Link2? How has Link2 been faring through all this? You know, knock on wood, but we we have been very much of a, a, a contrary to market story uh, so far, Linda. Um, and the best way of phrasing this is that, you know, when the market went into a uh, bear market phase in, in, in the public equities market, and then within six months of that, as we talked about, the private markets followed suit. The sector that was most hurt in technology, both in the public as well as the private markets, in terms of valuation, compression, and share price decline, was fintech, which is the space that we, we are in, right? Fintech. And then, uh, you know, blockchain, which is still mostly a private market play, uh, was also the most impacted. And we've got our toe in that particular pool. And if you want, we can talk about that a little bit in this conversation later on. But the bottom line is that if you're a fintech company and you have some exposure or the other to blockchain, I mean, that was like the mother of all storms and you had been hugely impacted. So when you look at companies in the public markets, for example, like, you know, uh, Robinhood, Coinbase, uh, Forge Global, right? You you will see that those companies suffered revenue declines of anywhere between you know twenty seven percent on the low side to um, fifty five sixty percent on the high side. That was the range of revenue decline, and their share prices declined in in like fashion, uh, um, anywhere from twenty seven thirty percent to sixty percent seventy percent. Right. That's huge. In our case, we actually were able to increase our revenues year on year, right? By close to 50%, five zero. And we did that without sacrificing profitability. Last year, we we had, you know, we ran the business with close to 40% EBITDA margins, right? And um, and um, you know, made revenue of about 30. Seven million and and net income of about nine million off of that. So that in in a market that was hugely challenged, we 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 produced just some crazy, you know, contra market results. And I'm I'm proud to say that we've sustained that through the first quarter of this year. We we just closed our books on on Q1 this year, and and we remain profitable and continuing to grow our top line. Congratulations. So it's a tribute to the team at Link2, but it also, I tell you, it is also an indicator, right, that the market that we're addressing is still fundamentally early and therefore continuing to grow, even as the broad market is contracting. Right. And, and what is that market? It's the market for individuals like you and me, regular people, to invest in private market stock. And we keep hoping that the SEC will change the accredited investor rules so that it makes it more open to a larger group of people rather than just people with specific net worth requirements. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm obviously a, a, a passionate, um, you know, advocate for that opening up Linda and and you know it, it's more than just being self-serving because obviously if that were to happen that would you know basically remove the single biggest constraint honestly to our growth which is that we we can only make our investments available to folks who are accredited investors which is a, a financial bar that the SEC imposes you got to have a certain amount of income and or a certain amount of net worth and and certain is rel relatively high, right? Um, and that's actually, when you stop, sit back and think about it, does that actually make sense? Because if the whole point of the SEC is we want to protect folks, right, from investments that are, you know, clearly more risky, um, then it should be based upon somebody's ability or level of sophistication to discern risk and their appetite for it, 
right? Um, so there, I, you know, I, I had I, a conversation with Hester Peirce, who's probably the most enlightened member of the commission today. And we talked about this and I said, you know, Hester, doesn't it make more sense if we were to give people sort of a mini test that ascertain their level of financial sophistication and therefore ability to make investments of this type, plus certain limits, uh, you know, if they didn't have a certain level of net worth or a certain level of income, then you say, okay, uh, you can still invest in this, but you can only invest up to 10% or 20% of your net worth or whatever, right? Wouldn't that make more sense than simply barring folks and preventing them altogether from investing? And, and her answer was absolutely, that makes complete sense, right? But yeah. unfortunately, the other members of the commission don't have that same forward thinking. And so we're kind of stuck. Yeah, I mean, back in the day when I was working for a big brokerage firm, it was that there were high initial investment requirements and, of course, net worth requirements, too, at that time. But the reasoning was that it was not a liquid investment for, you know, possibly many years. And that's why they said that they were making the limitations to investors because you had no way to liquidate your funds. You had no way to cash out. You had no way to get your money back for years. And so it kind of made sense that you had to have more assets or more income in order to be able to sort of endure that whole process. But now Link2, again, is democratizing finance by wanting to provide liquidity so now tell us about how you're trying to add liquidity and working with regulators to make a change in the industry. Thanks for asking that question because it's actually hugely important, right? One of the big barriers, as you rightly point out, to investing in the private market is that the asset is inherently illiquid. And, and so you've got this risk that, you know, if, if the company you've invested in is going to take three years to IPO and after a year and a half, something happens in your life that requires you to get extra cash and you hadn't predicted you'd need, you're sort of stuck, right? We, we have an approval from the SEC to operate, you know, what they call an alternative trading system or an ATS. I mean, in, 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 in plain English, what that simply means is that we have the ability on our platform now to allow our members to buy and sell their investments amongst one another, right? That creates liquidity that in the past was un unknown uh, in, in, in this market. So if you made an investment in XYZ company with the view that you were going to hold it for X amount of time, and then for whatever reason you decide that you can't live with it that long, you can now offer that on your platform, and we we actually did a test launch on a, on on PolySign stock yesterday, and we had folks that sold PolySign, as well as folks that were buying PolySign. Okay, so that was the very first transaction of that kind. Exciting yeah. transactions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I don't think that um, it's going to change the basic sort of investment proposition in the sense that the vast majority of people making private investments are doing that precisely because they want to have that early entry position, right, that allows them to significantly benefit from that future IPO or liquidity event. So they'll, they'll continue to hold the stock for the most part. But I can see situations where you know, one we talked about, you have a personal emergency or something changes in your financial life that requires you to have that liquidity. So that would be one impetus. The other is what I call portfolio reallocation, right? You might decide at a certain point that, you know, um, you, you want to diversify um, some of your holdings in a particular stock in order to buy into a new stock that you don't have in your private portfolio. So you can, you can liquefy a portion of that old holding in order to fund your entry into a new holding, 
that kind of portfolio restructuring or reallocation is something that that um, our our trading system will will support. Yeah, and that's a huge change. And for people who aren't as familiar with private equity investing, you know, normally, as you said, the the exit is hopefully to have an initial public offering to go public on the stock market and sell your private shares to the you know in the stock market and or have those you know be sold so that yours can appreciate uh, from where you purchase them or sometimes they're bought out by an acquisition uh, but if those things don't happen there really wasn't another way to have liquidity but now you have this alternative trading system where you're actually able to trade with members and people can liquidate and i mean that's really a game changer it is I, the other use case also is what I call pre-IPO, you know, gains harvest, right? What, well, what that simply means is that, let's yeah, so go back to that example, you invest in stock XYZ thinking you're going to hold it for three years. If that company does what it's supposed to do and continues to create value prior to the IPO, what that means is that its stock price is going to be trading up in the private markets even before the IPO. Somebody may want to just realize some or all of that gain before the company goes public, right? Mm -hmm. they, can, they can then sell the stock that they acquired three years ago today and just take the capital gain and not wait for the, for the IPO, right? Then, I mean, obviously, it's a calculation of, you know, how much are you giving up? But you at least have that possibility, whereas in the past, you didn't. Yeah, and I think that's even more important today because the IPO market's kind of stalled right now. So not many companies are going public and you know that's a factor of the market and the market not having fully recovered uh the stock market not having fully recovered. And so, you know, I think it's a good thing that you've got this other choice now because we don't know, I mean, what's your opinion, Joe? When do you think the IPO market is going to like get a little stronger and where maybe some of your companies might be able to start talking about going public. So I was in New York about a month ago and part of the time I was there was just meeting with a whole bunch of investment banks trying to get uh, a sense of what the street um, was thinking about exactly this question. And I think the consensus is that, you know, there's a possibility it may reopen in, in Q4 of this year. But what is probably much more certain is that next year, next year, we'll, we'll, we'll see the, the IPO market reopen. Um, on the link to portfolio, interestingly enough, right, I would say that there are probably seven to 10 companies I could point to that are IPO ready, meaning that if the IPO market were to reopen next year, say, those companies will almost certainly be in line to file, go through the process, and uh, do their initial public offering. Wow, that would be exciting. I could see where that might happen in a very short window. Yeah, and you know, some of the savvier companies, I mean, I can tell you that there, there are companies out there like, you know, we don't have exposure to, um, you know, Clavio comes to mind, Instacart is another, um, maybe Klarna. I, I, Gotta imagine they're already talking to their bankers today and 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 trying to get ready for the process in anticipation of either a Q4 or a 2023 reopening of the market, right? I mean, I think the key thing is going to be that um I think I think that if there, I, I if I could point to a single event that could drive that, it would be a clear signal from the Fed that they're taking their foot off the pedal in terms of the interest rate hiking regime because uh, you know their key inflation indicators are showing a positive trend um, downward, right? When that happens, that's going to signal to the markets. You'll, you'll, you'll probably see a, a, a fairly material reaction in the public markets in terms of you know, share prices, and, and that's going to then provide the impetus for the, the IPO market starting to reopen. Well, the bond market is already pricing in lower rates later this year. So we'll see if maybe this May rate hike might be the last one, if they even get to it with 
you know, all that's going on in the banking system, we may not even see that hike. It remains to be seen. Goldman Sachs doesn't think that they're going to hike. So uh, it's interesting. I, I've never been in a market just, you know, talking about this um, in, in my in, in my life in, in the finance industry that has been as difficult to read as 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 the one that we've been in um since you know the, the end of 2021 and difficult in the sense that there are so many um contrary signals that are in opposition to each other right and, and as a result of that there's just no clear consensus in either direction it's just so difficult to read yeah. So I know all the Ripple shareholders are going to want me to ask you this. Uh, we've heard that if the lawsuit ends or when the lawsuit ends, that Ripple would want to go public possibly pretty soon after that. Do you think that may happen if we if we got good news? I mean, their lawyers are thinking they were thinking we could hear something in March. Now it's April. We still haven't heard anything. If we get word sometime April, May, do you think there's a possibility that Ripple could go public? Yes, although just to, you know, remind everybody, right, you don't go public overnight. There's a process, and that process is typically, you know, six months for, for, for any company because it requires a fair amount of documentary preparation. It requires the submission of certain filings to the SEC for review and approval, that has its own timeline. Uh, it requires you going before the exchange that you want to list and providing a whole bunch of filings there, get, going through a review and approval process there. So all that's going to need to happen. It's a ministerial process, but it's a process that nonetheless will take time. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I think that they would pull the trigger very quickly once they clear the legal hurdle, and then it's just a matter of going through that process to finally get to the public market. But look, the reality was in January of, I think it was 2020, so roughly 11 months before the SEC filed suit, right? Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple, had announced to the world that they intended to go public. And, you know, I, I can imagine that if that suit hadn't been filed, so here's the chain of events. So that was January of 2020. In March of 2020, the markets, the public markets shut down and the IPO market closed because of the pandemic. Remember that? The IPO market didn't start coming back to life in August, until August of that year. And then in September, it was really clearly open. So if Brad had made the decision to pull the trigger, it would have been in that time frame, in that fourth quarter of that year. And I, I fully believe that if the SEC hadn't filed suit in December of that year, they would have pulled the trigger. Hmm, interesting. And of course, wasn't Coinbase like the last company of yours that went public before all this happened, before the market really turned? Yeah, yeah. And that was that was that was a Cinderella story for us, Linda, because you know, Coinbase, when we invested in it, was actually valued less, less than Ripple. Ripple was at that time in the private market, had just received a valuation of 10 billion. And um Coinbase at that time was actually valued even less than Robinhood, believe it or not. It it was valued at about my recollection is it was about in the four to five billion dollar range in the public in the private market. So we were able to get in at a really low entry point. And 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 the reason for that was because um it was a time where the VC community in the private market still hadn't fully bought on to the growth opportunity that blockchain technology represents. So most of the private market investing was being done by a very narrow uh, swathe of VCs, but not the broad VC um, ecosystem. And that had a depressive 
impact on the price of Coinbase and also Ripple, right? They were valued less than non-blockchain fintech peers, right? Because, it, you know, um, as I said, Robinhood has had a much more superior valuation of Coinbase at that time. I mean, I uh, today that's not the case in the public markets, right? Um, but that was the case in the private markets. Um, but because of that opportunity to invest in Coinbase at what was a fairly depressed valuation, our investors and we were able to realize a return that was close to nine and a half X within a, an investment period of less than 12 months. Wow. So a $10,000 investment went up to $95,000. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> That's a lot of private equity investing, right? You can get in at early prices, yeah. much lower prices. And, you know, again, that was sort of like right at the peak of the market where they just had perfection priced in. And not every company can do that. It's just not that part of the cycle, but they just happened to be at that part of the cycle where it was the perfect time to go public. And they really capitalized on that. Yeah. But think about it, right? And he, this is the other advantage of investing early because you're able to get that very, very attractive entry point. Even if our customers, and I don't know, I've not spoken to, to any of them stayed long the stock or they old after the IPO lockup ended, right? Which would have, that's what would have driven the nine and a half X number I'm talking about. That's based on the when the lockup period ended and what the stock price was of Coinbase at that point. But assuming if somebody for whatever reason held it, obviously Coinbase has gotten crushed since then, but they'd still, they wouldn't have lost money. They'd still be looking at, you know, a three X gain. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, what we've been through in the markets is very extreme. I mean, and, and that happens from time to time as an investor. That's what stock markets do. That's when Warren Buffett likes to buy and to, you know, be greedy when others are fearful. And like you were saying when we started, this is the perfect time to take advantage of that because prices are much lower than they were. And you have the opportunity to get in below where you could have gotten in a year or two ago. And so the, the opportunity is even more exciting today that whenever the market does recover, the potential, you know, maybe that much greater, we can't promise, but might be, you know, an even greater profit potential than it would have been if we didn't have the dip in the market. So this is a great time for investors to continue to invest and to consider private equity as part of their portfolio, I think. Yes, no doubt, um, no doubt. Um, so I, at, at the end of the day, the, the investment proposition simply is that um, I can't predict on any given day, right, whether uh, a, a, a company stock is gonna trade up or trade down. I can, I, I can however, predict two things with, fairly high degree of certainty because they're uh, these are conclusions that are based purely on the historical statistics, right? One is that in the long run, that price is going to trade up and not trade down, um, right? If you're, if you're investing in a fundamentally good company. So unless you have a, um, a, a death event where a company basically fails and goes bankrupt, um, that share price will 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 uh, will trend upward and to the right over time, and the second is that your investment return on that stock is going to be more than anything else um, be driven by your entry price, and the best entry prices are always always gotten earlier and not later. Earlier means private before they become fully valued in the public market. And, and so our investment proposition is that simple. It, it's just based on those two things, right? I love it. I think that's a good place for us to end. Thank you so much, Joe. This was really enlightening. I loved everything you shared with us and giving us an update on some of your companies was really valuable too. Thank you, Linda, for the opportunity to share with you and um, all of your followers. 
some of these insights. Um, I'd encourage them to just, you know, check out the platform, look at the offerings and um, reach out to you or to me um, directly if there's any way we can help answer their questions, educate them and uh, make them good investors in the private markets. I, I'd be honored. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Linda. And see you in Vegas. You got it. <laughs>